Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. Today, we'll be talking about Zofia Naukowska, a modernist psychological realist novelist, a feminist, a politician in later life, and a motivator of culture through the salon she hosted from her home on number four Marszalkowska Street in Warsaw during the interwar period. Newcomers to Polish literature following our program may recognize her name from our discussion of Bruno Schulz, with whom she was very close for a short period, and who she connected with the publisher Rui, which published Schulz's two collections of stories. Today we'll be chatting with one of her main translators into English, Ursula Phillips, to consider why her work is so important to Polish literature in the 20th century particularly regarding the idea of form in Gombrowicz and Witkatze, two other writers we've discussed on the program, form being the idea that we are governed by social constructs from which we should try to break free. Be sure to click the subscribe button in the YouTube description down below. Also, click the bell if you'd like notifications and you want to keep up with all of our discussions on encounters with Polish literature. But before we get to that, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about how to read a work of fiction as a critic or a scholar, as I would in an undergraduate class on the novel. Now, if this material is familiar to you, please feel free to skip ahead to the discussion of Zofia Naukowska with Ursula Phillips around the 10 minute mark or so. But if you're a student or if you're interested in the topic of how to read with the intention of writing about what you're reading, or if you're a teacher or an academic, and might want to compare your approach to mine, stick around and you might find it useful. Not everyone wants to take notes as they read, and that's fine. That's perhaps how most writers imagine readers consuming their work, remembering what they can because forgetting is also part of consciousness, experiencing the work as one would experience everyday life. Now, Kowska loves the character study and one often faces a non-stop onslaught of new characters introduced almost until the last chapter of the work. Her plots often depend on the flow of information in the novel and the pathways of information track family relationships and friendships among the characters. I recommend keeping a character list with the name of each character, the numbers of the pages where they are introduced or described, and also their nicknames, if Slavic nicknames are unfamiliar to you, with notes on the relationships among the characters. For instance, in the novel Boundary, Elspieta, one of the main characters, which is the Polish form of the name Elizabeth in English, is known variously as Ella, but to her school friends as Bieta, and to her close relatives as Eljunia. She is Zenon's main love interest, whom she eventually marries. Ursula Phillips's translation of Boundary includes a pronunciation guide for Polish names, which lists most of the characters. So if you don't mind writing in books, and if you own your own copy, of course, you can use that list. Otherwise, make your own. Separate sheet of paper, do it on your computer, put it in a separate notebook, whatever works for you. A big issue in understanding the form of the novel lies in understanding the relationship between time and space, or what the Russian theorist Mikhail Bakhtin called the chronotope. A novel that is serialized in a newspaper or a weekly magazine, for instance, often follows the chronotope of the surrounding stories, unfolding like news on a daily or weekly basis. Keep track of time markers in the work, like where it says, a week later, or as the snow began to melt, or when Zenon returned from his studies, and then keep track of the page numbers because the text will be your evidence if you have to make an argument about it in written form. You may find it useful to keep a timeline in some cases when a novel uses multiple time frames. Now, Kowska's novel, The Romance of Teresa Hennert, for instance, works much like the newspaper, showing everyday life unfolding over a period that's about the length of the spring season. With information revealed through gossip that moves along family lines, with occasional retrospective passages, for instance, about the character Basha Olinowska, who came from a family of the gentry but lost her parents and now works in the Warsaw office where some of the action takes place. 
The time is around the time of the publication of the work. In the early 1920s, after Poland achieves independence in the wake of the First World War, there is another reference in the novel to the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. So maybe readers of the novel in the 1920s would guess that Basha lost her parents in the pandemic. And while she loses her family and, gain, and her inherited wealth, she gains freedom as an independent woman through work. And if we do think the pandemic is an important background element of the romance of Teresa Hennert, we might compare that novel to the canonical pandemic novel um, by Catherine Ann Porter, Pale Horse, Pale Rider, which has an independent working woman as its main character. I'm getting ahead of myself, but you can see how paying attention to these kinds of details in the structure of the work can open up a web of connections that give you topics to write about and ways of understanding the work in its historical and literary context. Think about the narrator as a character in the work who is also subject to the flow of information. Is it a first person or a third person narrator? What does the narrator know? First person, the narrator who speaks as I, usually implies a limited perspective, while third person suggests omniscience, knowing everything. But sometimes first person narrators slip into an omniscient voice. And sometimes third person omniscient narrators may be omniscient only about things that can be observed like a scientist. And some other omniscient narrators may know what the characters are thinking inside their heads, or they may be omniscient about observable phenomena, but they may infer psychology from behavior. It's a good idea to keep a list of themes with references to the pages where they are discussed. So you can find them again when you have to write about them. Themes that come up often in Naukowska, for instance, are women's independence, sexual equality, the aging woman's body, Polish independence, and war. You should be aware of the plot or the action of the novel. If you had to say what happens in a novel, you would probably want to summarize the plot in a paragraph or so. While we may think the plot is what the novel is about, it's not always the most interesting thing. The action of the romance of Teresa Hennert isn't much of a romance, for instance. More than halfway through the book, though maybe on a second reading you would recognize earlier signs that are more apparent, a war veteran who seems to silently endure internal trauma becomes narcissistically attracted to Teresa, a married woman, who goes along with it without evincing any reciprocal desire because it seems like the thing to do as a woman of her station in that era in society, and it all ends rather badly. Shuka's plot depends on the chronotope of the sanatorium, where various characters intermingle in the same location for a limited period of time, and then disperse on a schedule largely unrelated to their relationships. But in Boundary, there is a counterpoint among three timelines of action that give the novel a sense of speed and direction. But let's save that for our discussion with our guest. Ursula Phillips has a background in both Russian and Polish studies and a doctorate from the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw, Ibel Pan, as it's known. She worked for nearly 25 years in the library of the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, which has since 1999 been part of University College London, where she remains an honorary research associate. For over 15 years now, she has worked primarily as a translator of academic and literary works from Polish and has pursued research primarily on Polish women writers of the 19th and early 20th centuries. But she did not begin translating only 15 years ago. As far as I know, she was the first English language translator to take on one of the ambitious novels of Wiesław Myśliwski, Palace, published by Peter Owen Publishers in 1991. I taught her translation myself of Maria Wirtemberska's early 19th century novel, Malvina in a course on the Polish novel first in 2000. And she has also translated Narcisa Szmichowska's spiritual novel, The Heathen. I can't stress enough what a risk it is to take the time to translate works like Malvina and The Heathen by 19th century Polish women writers virtually unknown at the time in the English speaking world. 
before she had a contract in hand. Thankfully, both of these works and two novels that Ursula Phillips translated by Zofia Naukowska, Shuka and Boundary, are in print and available today from Northern Illinois University Press. Her latest published translation is Grzegorz Nijoek's book, The Polish Theater of the Holocaust, published by Bloomsbury in 2019. She has co-edited several collections of essays on Polish literature, including three on women's writing with Ursula Chovanyets. Her most recent edited volume is Polish Literature in Transformation, edited by Ursula Phillips, with the assistance of Knut Andres Grimstad and Chris van Heuklem from Lit Verlag in 2013, which addresses developments in Polish literature from 1989 to 2012. Welcome, Ursula. Thank you very much for having me. Zofia Naukowska was um, a feminist in her views, and those views come through in her work, but she wasn't necessarily uh, part of the feminist movement, which was quite active, right, in the, in the interwar period. Yeah, but not only in the interwar period, we could say that right from the beginning. Um, you know, from her novel, Kobiety, Women, that was published in 1906, and followed up by the speech she made to the first Women's Congress in 1907. I mean, this was more about sexuality, about claiming the whole of life, as she put it, as a woman, uh, criticising the double standard, criticising hypocrisy in marriage, um, criticising the kind of sexual behaviour for women that was dictated by patriarchy, by men. Um, and this kind of issue dominated a lot of this early prose so she wasn't she was writing about trying to be you know fulfilled as a woman and this very much included the sexual dimension she wanted an end to the double standard basically um she also was acutely aware probably from her own experience how women can suffer in relationships um so whilst it's slightly contradictory because on the one hand she's demanding full sexual equality for women but on the other hand her heroines are people that suffer from being portrayed in love so this mm. parallel to this there's still the ongoing desire for exclusivity and which is something that you know she never had in her own life both of her husbands all her lovers they all betrayed her eventually and she was acutely aware of the suffering that this can cause. And how did you uh, come to be interested professionally in uh, in the work of Zofia Naukowska? I mean, of course, she's obviously an interesting writer. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things uh, about Naukowska, aside from her you know, feminist views and so forth, is the salon that she you know led uh, in the uh, in the interwar period, where you know virtually all of the major intellectuals yeah. uh, are passing through her uh, through her living room. Um, so yeah, uh, you've already talked about two of them, mm -hmm. um, Bruno Schultz and Vitot Gombrovic. Um, and uh, Stanisław Ignacevitkiewicz also came to the salon. I know that they met in Yeah, Zakopana, they were friends. Yeah, they knew they each friends. other, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another writer that we, we've covered in the in the series. Um, so how did you become involved in uh, in working on Naukowska? Well, this stemmed from my friendship with Grazina Borkowska. I tra translated her book, um, Alienated Women, um, the title that was forced on me by the publisher. In Polish, it's Sudza Jemki. The earlier novel that uh, that you translated uh, is uh, called Shuka uh, in, yeah. uh, in English. Um, and this is a novel about people who meet at a sanatorium um, in, uh, in the Alps in Switzerland. And it was uh, um, based on her own uh, experience in such a sanatorium town um, in uh, Les Aines, um, mm -hmm. where she spent 1925. And the, and the novel takes place, it was published in 27, I think, but it, it takes place in, in 1925 there there are some references if I'm not mistaken um, and uh, and she calls this an international novel um, what makes it an international novel what is that it was Vodek Boletsky um, who encouraged me to translate this book um, as my first Narkovska because of that title 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it reflects um, an international community that are, you know, re the representatives of, you know, most of the European nations or their colonies um, in this little sanatorium. Um, and they all sh they all talk about each other and hold various prejudices against each other, and she shows she shows up you know kind of international hatred. I mean, hatred is the word a word she uses. Um, tensions between these nations, which are largely based not on any you know true knowledge, but on in internalized stereotypes um, of what Germans are or you know French are or or, or whatever. And she, the implication is that it's, you know, this is dangerous possibly for international relations. Um, but, you know, the, um, and we can talk, I'll talk a little bit about some of those people in a minute, particularly the Armenians. The Armenians uh, aren't there taking the cure. They're refugees who were placed there by the, the refugees who survived the genocide um, yes. of 1916, um, 1516. And they were rescued and placed there by the Red Cross. So that's why they're there. Mm -hmm. um, one of them particularly is suffering from trauma. Um, she never leaves her bed. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, they are important commentators. Um, but to, just to return slightly to your first question, she uses as international. I mean, this was the why we thought initially this would have an international appeal because it was international. Um, but she doesn't use the normal word for international, which is Mianzi Narodova. So it's not to use it internationalna. And in the translation, it was not possible to make that distinction. But it's not just about um, you know, relations between different nationalities in terms of countries and nation states. I think it's also a reference, cryptic reference, um, to the situation back home, because this novel was written um, after the time that she'd spent with her second husband, Gorzachowski, um, a former uh, associate of, um, what well, still an associate of Pilsudski, a former legionary who became the head of the military police in Grodno. And she lived there with him. And she saw as part of her life there how the new Polish state was treating minorities, national minorities within the Polish state. So you know, international, na internationalism here, I think, is also a reference to what was going on at home, you know, because what she did while she was in Grodno, much mm. to the displeasure of Gorzachowski, was to visit the prison. And there she saw not only, um, you know, criminals, murderers, but political prisoners, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. And she also, in her discussions with the prison authorities, um, knew how they were being treated, how they were being beaten up and, and things like this. And she recorded all this in her diary. And it's the only part of the diary that I'm aware of that she gives a separate title to. No, she calls it Vienzhenia, hmm. prison. So this was something that really deeply concerned her um, because she could see that the very methods that had been used by the Tsarist police were being repeated. And this is something that is stated as a kind of leitmotif by one of the characters, um, Madame Vogdeman, mm -hmm. who is a very mysterious person at the beginning of the of the of the book. But she it turns out that she's a Bolshevik or an ex-Bolshevik, and she's fled because she can't cope morally with what's going on in Russia. You know, she says that well, the revolution needed to happen. You know, there was a lot of injustice, but war imprisonment and the power of some over the life and deaths of others remains the same. Now, this is a sort of more general articulation of the same problem that in the earlier novel that she published in 1924, The Romance of Teresa Hennett, she's actually specific about this. There are comments by young soldiers that have come back from the Kresse or the borderland area um, who've been fighting the various wars there, 
who um, comment on this, on the treatment of, of minorities. So that that is, you know, I think what's meant, what's implied. But by this stage, she's not being so specific about relating it to Poland. She's making it more general because I think, you know, in her writing, she moves from the general from the specific into the more general. Maybe you can say a little about, you know, how she, uh, you know, how, how knowing the connection between her diary and the work, how she, uh, how that experience in Les Ains, uh transferred to the work. I know you visited Les Ains yourself. Mm. The diary is something she kept all her life. And there have various theories about its purpose. Um, and Bukowska believes that, you know, it was her way of sort of creating herself in a sense. She, she communicated with the diary. She wrote in the diary all the time. She was creating this this persona of um, Zofia Nalkowska. Um, but, you know, I also think it's a very, very important repository of material, of experience, which she was then reworked later, sometimes many, many years later, um, in her fiction. But with uh, Shuka, it was much more immediate. Mm. Um, and if you read the diary that she kept in the, I think it was four, four or five months that she was there, uh, at the beginning of 1925, a lot of the material is transferred word for word. Um, so, you know, the, just to give us a few little details, the cog train, which features in the book quite um, importantly, um, this is still the main way, if you haven't got a car, of getting up from the valley, getting up from Egg um, on the shores of Lake Geneva up to Les Ormes. It takes about 45 minutes, goes up the very steep mountain, and it's still the same mechanism. And, you know, the, you get out at the station at Les Ormes Fede, which is near the place where she actually stayed, which I, I managed to discover which, exactly where it was. It goes up again through the rocks into there's a tunnel, very steep tunnel within the rock, comes out at the back of the hotel, which is the top station. And there's a little gangway that you can walk over still into the back of the hotel on the second floor. And she describes all that in the novel. Then of course, there, there are the mountains, you know, I mean, this was one reason why, another reason why I wanted to do it. it wasn't just because I was persuaded by Vodek that it was a, you know, a very good novel. And he was the only person apart from Kirchner. Professor Kirchner, who has actually written about this, this novel. Um, the other thing, I was just inspired by the beautiful place. The first time I ever went abroad was to the French Alps, and I adore that mountain scenery and the snow and the glaciers. And, you know, so I was really inspired to translate those particular passages as well. Uh and you saw the birds from the title, the Shuka, which are that that's kind of a mysterious title, I think, to uh, to most uh, English readers. Yeah. So these are birds who live in the high Alps. And if you look up Shuka in, in a standard, you know, English French dictionary, it'll tell you it's a jackdaw, but it's not a jackdaw. It's an alpine chuff. And she actually distinguishes in the book, in part of one of the chapters, she distinguishes both the jackdaws, between a jackdaw and, and, a, and one of these birds. Um, well, you know, what is the purpose of these birds? Well, you know, I think it's very much connected with the author's sensitivity, which is very feminine. Um, it's a woman's perspective and who, and she, you know, in that opening scene, there's a clear tension between her male companion and herself about how they should treat the birds and, you know, how, how they like to eat. You know, there's a little dis discussion about that. Um, but, you know, they're very gentle looking birds or she, she perceives them as gentle. And, um, you know, I was very, very fortunate um, in many things when we went to, um, with, to Les Ains with the contacts I had. And in the case of the birds, it so happened that a colleague of mine, um, Corinne Fournier Kish, who is also a, you know, somebody that writes on 19th century Polish women, so happens that her brother is an ornithologist. And he took me, he took me up, it was in the summer, I hasten to add, not in the winter, took me up to the high rocks and the mountain above Les Ains. So we had to go to the top of the cable car and then walk pretty exhausting and we took a picnic but it was a 
magnificent day. And, you know, as soon as we opened the picnic, the birds were there. They were all around us. And they they do have a sort of gentility. It's difficult to pinpoint it. You know, I can see how she under, she saw them as, as, as gentle. And they're sleek and black and very sort of calm, you know. And um, so I took some little videos on my phone. So I had these to refer to when I was translating the book. In that opening scene, one thing that, that struck me is that um, she always maintains a certain distance from the birds and she's always, she's kind of like a, you know, like the you know, scientific observer. Um, oh, yeah. and, and, and that says something about, I think, her narrative approach, right? I mean, she's always looking at behavior, looking at what people do, as opposed to her yeah. partner in the, in the work who says, oh, I'll feed them. I know what they think. She was, you know, very interested in psychology and how this was, you know, manifested in behaviour. So, you know, in a sense, she looks at the birds in the same way she looks at, at the human beings. Yeah. And one of the Armenians, uh, the one that is not confined to bed, um, she is dressed, you know, in this black outfit. Everything is black and then you get her little pale face and her lips, you know, and She's almost like one of these little birds, you know. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of um, a lot of possible symbolism. But, you know, it, it's striking that her attitude to the birds is different from the locals. Because when, when I was there, I asked people about the birds and they clearly felt that they were birds of ill omen. Hmm. Uh, whereas she sees them as gentle companions, yeah. Um, you know, I mean when the birds come down to the village causing havoc because they're looking for food, it's a sign of really bad weather mm -hmm. up in the mountains. Yeah. It's a very threatening. And so you have that final image um, when she leaves in the cog train going down the mountain of the massive flock of birds of these shuka um, circling circling over the valley and you wonder well, what's the significance of that hanging over in Europe. This kind of observation, this you know, sort of almost quasi reportage uh, is oh, yeah. one one form of um, uh, narration that she uses. And the other uh, that she mentions uh, first, uh, I, I think I noticed it in uh, the romance of Teresa Hennert, and, and also it's it's a big issue in, in Boundary, is mm. the role of gossip. I mean, it's as mm. if the novel is a kind of a vehicle for um, for gossip or, you know, the, especially if you think about in, in Shukash, I don't think she says it explicitly there, but this is a novel that's very much a novel about the flow of information and uh, things like that. There's there's not if you tried to find the plot of, of Shuka, it's not as um, obvious as the plot of boundary. You know, from a formal point of view, from a Jean point of view, um, is it a novel? You know, I mean, it, it sort of verges between you know diary and novel or reportage and novel. Um, so you know, the story there isn't exactly very much of a story, um, but. You know, there are threads that happen, you know, what happens to the, the Jewish um, um, TB sufferer, um, what happens to this couple um, that she observes with a very young man and an elderly woman, well, elderly, a middle-aged woman who feels she's aging, you know, there are these little, little plots that, that sort of develop, but everything is conveyed by hearsay, you know, it's, she doesn't, actually have a great deal of direct information yeah she gets it from what other people say about each other yeah or what they say about you know what's going on in the world um it's basically only the armenians that she gets or particularly sosse one of the armenians the one in bed where she gets direct commentary it's almost you know a, a, a description of what life on you know in a in a resort or a spa or a sanatorium might be like. I mean, uh, there are these temporary stories that have somehow entered your head while you're on location, and yeah. uh, and that's the local news. <laughs> yeah, it is. But um, you know, as I said, you know the subjects that come up um, about international relations, about stereotypical judgments and prejudices between nations, and also some of the longer term humanitarian implications are also what the book is about. And I think it's a very moral book in that 
sort of sense because you know Narkovska is not really interested you know in well I mean she is but minimally interested in why wars are fought but more in the in the nature of war what is war what is the psychology of war and you know she doesn't see it as a as a contrast to peace she sees it as the natural progression of how we behave anyway yeah that it's it's the, the sort of extreme way in which human humans interact it's a very pessimistic uh view and you know um if i might you know if you'll allow me to mention again Sosi and one of the, the armenian Please. she does make some very important statements about the nature of this um because there's an important passage well two important passages one where she refuses to say the whole of the armenian prayer where you pray for god to give you victory yeah your nation victory and she says you know we must stop at the line that says god save us from the suffering or protect us from suffering and not go on to ask god to defend specifically our nation Mm -hmm. And then later on, um, there is another passage where she's talking to the narrator about why she has given up faith in God, at least temporarily. And that is because she saw the suffering. We never hear what the Armenians actually saw. We only we're only told that they have these, you know, these dark, deep eyes that that saw dot dot dot. Yeah. But she says that, you know, this is nothing special. This is nothing unique. This is why I, I, you know, I can't believe in God anymore because this was what happened to the Armenians was not different. So she's looking at things not from the point of view of specific nations, but any possible nation. Yeah. And I, the reason why I think this is very important is because it looks ahead 20 years to medallions, to her Holocaust stories. Um, which were published immediately after the war, 1946, as a result of the evidence that she saw when she was part of the commission, the, the, the Polish State Commission for investigating Nazi crimes uh, on Polish, Polish soil. She opens the, these nov these um, short this short prose with an important epigraph. People dealt this fate to people, to use um, Diana Kuprov's translation. She doesn't say, um, you know, Germans did this to Jews or Germans did this to Poles. But the shocking thing is that people did it. Human beings did this to fellow human beings. And this is exactly the point that Sosse is making. So there's a connection here, you know, with thematically with, with this, you know, uh, indirect experience of trauma of horror of atrocity and what she witnessed uh, herself during um, the occupation in the early 1940s and then the evidence that she saw as part of that commission so i think this is you know it's her where her, she's coming from is is not a nationalistic position at all but a general human one and i think this is you know all her work uses poland and ex polish experience as the basis to speculate and universalize about general human behavior. Particularly you know, picking up from the, the topic of um, uh, the way gossip functions in the novel, I think that oh, that's, yes, yeah. there's that passage at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of Boundary that's, um, that's a scene of very vibrant gossip. This is all seen through the eyes of the 15-year-old Elzbeta. And the point about this is how it goes from humor grotesqueness, uh, shock and disgust to profound empathy. Because Elgbeta at some point, she's an intelligent observer of things, that she suddenly realizes, well, once they were like me, and one day I will be like them. Yeah, so it's a very interesting transition. Large bellies rested on spindly legs like barrels poised on matchsticks, while other legs were thick and straight and spilled between rolls of black stocking into tightly laced brogues. 
Faces sat heavily on plump double chins, fastened at the throat by garnet brooches, or swayed on elongated necks encircled by velvet chokers. While the play of muscles, veins and sinews running up and down visibly beneath the fine yellowish skin lent to their misshapen faces and spoken words an air of affected grand eloquence befitting their Sabbath. Aunt Cecilia likewise wore a velvet choker, over which two bags of excess skin hung down at the front and had no illusions as to her own appearance. But the thought that she too belonged to this witch's coven, this pageant of old harridans, that she too was one of them, was unpleasant indeed. The bitter truth mushroomed into a restless fear, a state of frightened panic. To perfectly remember how they had once been, and see them now so altered, to watch them grow older and older, some faster than others, and to be harnessed to the very same fate. What a mockery! For it transpired that between one visit and the next, some of them passed into another generation. More than one would depart at a dangerous age and return a year later as an old woman. Each one of them had once been young. Behind each one trailed her former youth like a flowering branch pinned to the hem of her outmoded dress. They had been wiped from the surface of life, cast aside by the drift of its deeper currents, majestic, fast flowing and bad. Breathless and exhausted, they lay washed up on the bank, remembering dead husbands, slaughtered sons and distant, indifferent families. War, revolution, the changed world had abandoned them to their stupefaction. With their gaze fixed on the lonely drama of arthritis and menopause, they confronted the anarchy of present times with the relics of former anarchies, the shipwrecked flotsam of trusted beliefs and bankrupt convictions. They still had to live a little bit longer in order to die. She's very straightforward in her descriptions of the body. Um, oh, elsewhere body. in the novel, I mean, she uh, addresses, uh, you know, sex with no, you know, no inhibitions, really. Uh, I mean, it's not explicit or pornographic by any stretch of the imagination, no. but, um, but it's, uh, it's very straightforward and matter of fact. Yeah, it is. I mean, and there's another description of Cecilia herself later when she's confined to bed and um, Elisabetta gives her a bed bath and the description of her falling out hair, her greasy scalp, her, you know, yellowing skin, lack of muscles. You know, it's very, very physical. In fact, it's what I have uh, suggested this elsewhere in my introduction, for example, that this is an early example of what Christieva, Julia Christieva, um, identifies as the category of the abject, mm. which is a psychoanalytic um, category. But, you know, it has something of that, you know, our, our disgust at these, you know, bodily things which somehow challenge our sense of ourselves, our, our security of who we are, you know, um, these, these physical things um, arise and, and frighten us. And, I, you know, that that is, you know, occurs quite a lot in this book in fact maybe maybe most uh, dramatically in uh, you know in the scene uh, that describes um of course after the uh, the affair uh, between uh, zenon and uh, and justina uh, this working class woman um there's this question that she becomes pregnant and there's this question of what to do with the baby um and the she's very ambiguous about it the narrator is very ambiguous about it um through much of the novel i mean the 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 sort of the narrative structure of the novel has uh, uh three kind of three kind of time frames and one is sort mm -hmm. of the narrative present that takes place over the space of a day or two uh, it seems yeah. when um when a uh, spoiler alert i guess we have to we have to in, in the world of literary criticism we have to talk about the whole work so spoiler alert um, <laughs> well, <laughs> zenon doesn't make it at the end <laughs> 
Uh, no, well, she gives that away in the first in the first two pages. She tells yes. us what happens. You know. Yeah, she she tells us but that he meets an untimely. Also, uh, so gossip and what what the newspapers are reporting. Yeah. Yeah, in that sense, uh, there he she <laughs> shares something in common with Tolstoy. It's like the beginning of the the uh, the death of Ivan Ilyich, where they're all reading oh, the newspaper yes. and say, "Oh, the magistrate yeah. Ivan Ilyich, the magistrate yeah. died," and you know, and absolutely, uh, it's it's very yeah, much it's that same comparison. yeah that same kind of technique. Um, so we know we know that Zenon died, um, and uh, and you know, we get that at the beginning in a little spot in the middle, maybe, and then then it comes back at the end, um, and. And then, uh, and that gives the, the the whole novel a sense of speed and and uh, and mm. forward Dying. motion. Mm. Um, and then there's another sort of time frame that's maybe you know sort of the the time the year or two immediately before then, which sort of is unfolding maybe a month at a time or you know by the season. Yeah, this is the, the sort of t the the uh, periods when uh, Zenon comes back from Paris. Yeah, and yeah. the first time when he comes back, there's the war, and then there's the you know, which is just mentioned in passing, and then the development of the you know the, the affair with with this dinner, and then there's all these flashbacks as well into the past that are mm. woven into it. Yeah, and then there's the the next time sort of chronology that happens when he comes back for the second time. Yeah, um, gets when he's you know gets married, he takes up the job. Um, and then you know uh, what is hidden from about halfway through is what actually happened to this baby and i can yes. remember the first time i read it thinking hang on we were supposed to be a baby here what's happened and then you realize that you know she's been setting the little building bricks all along and when you read it for a second time you realize how she'd done that because right at the very beginning when justina is reported in the papers as having been arrested and they can't wake out you know what this, this mad woman is saying um why she threw this acid at him and she said i came from the dead i was sent by the dead and later on we realize that this is the dead baby and it's only in chapter 26 which is the second last chapter penultimate chapter do we actually get the description of the actual abortion and Justina's own reaction to it. And that is very important, I think. And very physical, like these uh, other descriptions, more so than, um, I mean, and, and that must be, is there a connection in the diary there? I mean... Um... Well, this is a very interesting question because it's, you know, when I translated this, I thought, wow, you know, to actually describe that thing coming out of you and the pain um she must have experienced you might you know be difficult to write about if you hadn't experienced i asked hannah kirchner professor kirchner about this we had several discussions um about the novel this was one of the issues i raised with her did she did nalkovska ever have an abortion and she has never found any evidence that she had an abortion but she did suggest to me that there were various occasions in her life where she could have had a miscarriage i mean she never had she never had a child uh, so she she could have had miscarriages. Um, mm. She could have had an abortion. We don't we don't actually know. She does not record that at all. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? She certainly wanted to have experienced the whole of life. I mean, we know that. Well, uh, like men, right? So, yes. Yeah. I mean, the whole the whole issue of motherhood, which we can move on to in a sec. In yeah. this in this whole in this novel is very very conflicted. Um, but just to return to um, just dinner. It becomes clear that Justina didn't want to have this abortion, and she felt that she was being pressurised to have it because Zenon kept giving her money, and this was when he started to feel guilty about everything, and you know he was worried about her health because she was starting, you know, she started to go crazy a bit, and we'll I'll explain why I think that was, um, because we get the physical description of what happened about you know going to the midwife and having it done and how it felt afterwards. Um, but she has bad dreams as well. She has bad dreams, and there's a very moving passage um, in that chapter where it's clear that she regrets it. And it seems to be a moral question. It seems to be that it's not just a question that upset her emotionally, but she feels guilty about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, whilst, you know, I would never suggest that. Malkovska had any kind of pro-life Catholic agenda. I mean, she was an agnostic. Yeah, I don't think that comes into it at all. Um, it's 
not a straightforward endorsement uh, of having an abortion. And quite the contrary, because one thing that she, we're going back to the body, one thing that she observed was the way that the psyche is dependent on the body. And Hannah Kirchner calls this, calls this biologism. <laughs> that, you know, she was very, very aware of the body, of the way biology affects our lives. And what is being shown here with um, Justina is the interference with the natural processes of having a baby. Yeah, your body, you get pregnant, your body changes, it goes through various, you know, hormonic changes, um, you know, which should be leading to term and then delivery and then motherhood. If this is interrupted, particularly if the mother didn't want to, to interrupt it, this can have a serious effect on your mental health. And that is precisely what happens in this book, because the mm. whole the whole of the the second half of the novel, you know, because I'm an old structuralist, yeah. So exactly halfway through is the point where Elgbeta and um, Justina meet, and then from there on it's downhill, yeah. And you realise that it's probably retrospectively that's probably just after that that she had the abortion, and then her be behaviour becomes gradually more and more extreme, bizarre. She has a breakdown, in fact, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know, she's showing what she's showing is not the morality as such about abortion, but the negative effect an abortion can have on some women, not necessarily all, but you know. And I think quite a lesson for us in that, you know. <laughs> yes, and and that you know, I mean, it's it's again her her observational perspective. I mean, we don't know that um, that she's. Um, Presenting a, she's not making a, a kind of a political argument at no. that point, but no. it's more like trying to sympathize with this character who she's created, who then seems to have a life of her own. I mean that, um, and maybe her characters don't do or don't agree with, you know, with her own views. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, we don't know the views of the narrator. We don't know. We don't know the sex of the narrator. It's a third person narrator, but very, very retiring. And in fact, you know the. The, the narrative is built up from different focuses, isn't it? It's, it's built up from different perspectives, yeah? It moves from character to character mm -hmm. according to chapter, yeah? And the, it's almost like a camera focusing on one person's perspective. So you see events through their eyes and through their own limitations and prejudices. So you don't actually get an objective view of anything. And we have to sort of put that together for ourselves as as readers, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. So the another the other side of that is uh, is what happens to uh, Zenon, who uh, who uh, who was the the father of the aborted child. In his marriage and his affair, he he very much, despite being a young rebel who who wants to uh, not reproduce the uh, the mm. uh, the things that he found uh, disgusting in his parents and his parents' generation, uh, he ends up doing exactly the same thing. Yes, I mean she shows how behavior is or how she perceives behavior as being governed by culturally determined uh patterns i mean one part of the novel in, in fact it was the two chapters you know about um you know where uh, zenon finds out about the pregnancy tells elgbeta and then elgbeta confronts justina those chapters were published earlier as other parts of the novel were in a magazine under the title Chemate, Patterns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, particularly in this field of male-female relations, relations between parents and children, um, and also in public life, we see how society um, interrelationships with other people, and, you know, these cultural patterns that have been long established affect our behavior, we internalize them, yeah? And she calls them these patterns, and in my opinion, this is her version of form. Mm 
you know, we've talked about, I mean, you talked about form with Bojana, yeah, in Dombrovi. Bojana Shalkras in, uh, yes, in, this in our, yeah, in our that's right. Dombrovi this is something... episode of, of uh, Encounters with Polish Literature. And we also Sorry? talked about, yeah. in, in, in our episode of, you know, on Gombrowicz in Encounters with Polish Literature, and it's also something that we discussed with um, with uh, Benjamin Paloff uh, yeah. on uh, on Vitkatsis, <clears throat> Stanisław Vignacevitkiewicz in an earlier that's episode. That's right. I mean, form, you know, was in the air, in a sense. <laughs> But I would say that thematic, her idea of thematic, um, these patterns, uh, is closer to Gombrowicz. I would say and, so too. Yeah, and in the, in, there's an intervening novel, um, which I haven't translated yet, um, between Shuka and uh, Granitsa called Niedobra Miłość, Unkind or Bad Love. And in the opening paragraphs of that, she actually describes this idea that there is no such thing as character you know we don't have any any personality just on our own we don't have anything we are formed yeah by other people and that it changes all the time and you can be different things to different people yeah, yeah. um yeah so this is something that um not only governs our behavior but it also governs the way people judge us and a very important boundary in um in, in, in boundary in, in the novel um, is between the way that Zenon perceived himself and she because sh she shows him thinking about himself as well um, this boundary between the fact that he still sees himself as this idealistic young socialist and can't come to terms with the fact that you know Justina is causing such a problem for him well you know other men have other men have affairs and they you know they deceive their wives and they get away with it and so what you know why am i having to suffer and the public perception of him and this this is this is very important because he concludes and the action of the novel proves at least within the framework of the novel that the way we are perceived by people from the outside is what determines what we are and finally pronounces the judgment on us, not what we think about ourselves. And she starts with that, you know, expresses that, it articulates that conflict at the very first page of the novel, and it's borne out by the action, yeah? So, you know, when um, Zenon realizes that the two th threads have come together, so to speak, his public persona as a politician, as a compromised politician, and his personal life and what's happened there, um, the public and, and, and the um, private have, have sort of come to together to condemn him. Yeah. In both cases, he's always making, you know, al allowing himself to make certain compromises. I mean, uh, yeah. both, uh, you know, in the in the in the affair with Justina. I mean, for instance, he makes uh, uh, a, a grandiloquent confession to uh, to his wife Elspieta, um, and uh, you know, and then realizes, well, this was exactly the thing that his father did over yeah. and over again. Yeah. And then, as an editor yeah. um, uh, in uh, of, uh, of Niva, yeah. uh, he. Uh, you know, first, you know, somebody comes in and asks him for a political favor. Uh, well, could you publish uh, this person? And she, he thinks, well, maybe, maybe it would fit in this way. I, I could figure that out. Uh, and you know, and and does that. And eventually, yeah. you know, he's uh, he's calling the police on the on the workers, uh, despite having started as a socialist. And it all comes to a head in this 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 remarkable right. scene at the end, where there's a um, yeah. we're in the depression. There there have been people laid off from the local mill. Um, and there's a workers' uprising, and and he's running to uh, the town hall to to try to take control. I mean, maybe, maybe we can read. A yes, and that. he's already lost control by that by that point. But this this is where the two the two strands come together because he's just come from your dinners, and she, it's the first she's actually threatened him. He's not take seemed to have taken it particularly seriously, but she's threatened him. You know, that she's going to do something. Yeah. Um, and he, then he comes to the town hall, and the you know the the demonstration is already taking place. And then we learn later, you know, from the limited um, descriptions in the newspapers and from gossip uh, that shots have been fired. Yeah, we don't know who did it, whether it was him or whether it was Cheklinski. But for, you know, he as you say, he has gone over onto the other side. He's crossed the boundary. The 
policeman saluted and explained that National Square and access to the town hall were blocked by the crowd. It wasn't possible to get the car through. What about via Krutka Street? It proved to be possible. The chauffeur switched off the headlights. The same thing happened at the corner of Sondova Street and the car made another detour. Zenon ordered it to stop by the church wall and from there made his way on on foot along an alleyway and into a side square leading to the corner entrance of the building. The glass door leading to the, to the interior was shut. Darkness reigned inside. In the moment he approached, a group of people emerged from Emeritalma Street, walking quickly towards the town hall. A lamp on the opposite corner, fixed to the wall of an apartment building, not very high above the street, cast its full light onto this host advancing in silence. Apart from that one street lamp, it was dark all around. Zenon hurried up the steps. The door was locked. He rang the bell and stood for a moment, peering through the dark glass pane. He rang a second time. He was in a hurry. The crowd was coming closer. And then, with the accuracy of a vision, he saw a peculiar image reflected in that dark pane. He saw the collar of his fur coat, his bowler hat, the whole outline of his body and the countenance effaced by the darkness. Immediately behind his shoulder loomed the faces of the advancing workers. Marching in several lines, unfamiliar faces, almost identical, clear and vivid in the light of the street lamp. He thought of them as a fluid mass or a sea of heads, even though there were not that many of them. The actual crowd was the other side in National Square. Here there was only a small group. The clear image of the advancing people was sliced in half by the black silhouette of a man in a fur coat and bowler hat. In the reflection, it seemed he stood at their head. In reality, he was running away from them. That's, you know, I, probably one of the most uh, you know, dramatic passages, most, the most cinematic, the most dramatic mm. uh, passages in, in, in It's Nokoska. very cinematic, isn't it? It's very, yeah. you know, I mean, we are talking about, you know, the camera and focalization earlier. You know, it's like, how how you'd film something a lot of the time you don't get the explanation yeah you get the reporting of it he can't imagine himself um you know becoming you know becoming this person but then you know what else does he know right i mean he he and it really you know it yes. really raises a question of you know could we ever get outside of our, um, you know, uh, you know, the things background. that we've learned, our background, the things that we've, you know, we've internalized growing up yeah. uh, from our parents? Yeah. Or, or well, yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the big, you know, un underlying patterns is called the Boliboja pattern. And mm -hmm. Boliboja is this little estate where he grows up. And, you know, he was disgusted when he's young by the fact that, you know, um, the girls, the, 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 a lot of the father sleeps with a lot of the the girls on the on the farm, and they come to him at night. And um, his mother tolerates it. In fact, you know, his his mother lets him do it because you know men will be men, um, and she believes that this is how she keeps her husband um, by allowing it to happen. And you know, amongst the old ladies, one of the things that when they talk of gossip about her, they say, well, you know. She's a woman who knows how to handle her husband, you know. In other words, let him be a man, you know. Um, but this is shown to be very destructive because, you know, Zenon um, starts to behave in the same way. Um, not o not only when he he you know starts the affair with um, Justina, thus deceiving. Um, his fiance um, much better at the same time. When he's in Paris, he's doing it. He has a girlfriend there called Adele, whom he abandons. And then even when he goes back for the second time, already engaged to Elge better, there are these scenes where he goes to Montmartre to the prostitutes. So it's something that's very deep. And, you know, it reminds me also um, the father figure, pretty negative. 
um, of Omsky in the earlier book, you know, the romance of Teresa. The, and, yeah, the yeah, romance and his, of be, yeah, his behavior, you know, uh, his eventual cruelty and murder of her, you know, although he's disgusted by the fact of his own, the cruelty of his own father towards his mother, he actually himself behaves in the same way at the end of the day, you know. And then you take, if going back to Granitza, we see it in 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 Elgeta's behaviour at the end of the day as well, because you know one of the things that she's tormented by is that her mother abandons her to and she, to be brought up by Cecilia, um, her husband ex husband's brother. She never sees her father. Um, her mother marries somebody else, and that's a whole other important thread in the book, of course. She longs for you know some sort of normal normality, normal family life, but at the end of the book, after you know Zenon's suicide, she does exactly the same. She abandons her their baby. It's pessimistic. I mean, on the one, you know, it, it seems that <laughs> like uh, thinking about the relationship between Omsky and Teresa Hennert, I mean, it's called the novel is called The Romance of, of oh. Teresa Hennert, but it's uh, <laughs> Teresa Hennert seems to be just going along with what, whatever happens in these the various. Oh, you know, I mean, she's an she's almost an a soul, almost a soulless sort of empty, you know, um, tabula rasa. Against, and so is Omsky. Wait, 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 I mean, Omsky oh, is... Which all the characters reflected against. Yeah, but Omsky, um, you know, he has this background in the army and where he's one of these demobbed um, soldiers that, had, you know, fought for independence and then they're disillusioned by what they see afterwards. And he's an obsessive character, yeah? Uh, but, you know, I wonder whether, you know, this ironic title reflects the fact that, you know, despite all these you no know, love dramas that we see in the books um Malkovska isn't actually that interested in romantic love in in her characters she sees love in inverted commas as some kind of cultural category yeah a socially de mm. determined you know cultural category it's that's what she's looking at in a sort of with an ironic distance yeah the male characters all seem you know, very narcissistic and and self-involved, and and the women are almost instruments, in you know, in these, uh, or they are instruments, you know, and especially Teresa Hennard and Omsky. I mean, uh, but also yeah. looking at Zenon, well, I mean, you know, how you know. Yeah, but I mean, there there are female characters that 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 you know provide interesting commentary yes. on. I mean, we saw it with the Armenians, with Madame Vogdeman, uh, Madame Saint Albert in 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 Shuka. and then you know the perspective of Elgeta is very important. And yes. you know, my favourite character in the book is is Aunt Cecilia. She's, and, she's I mean, the most I mean, complex, she's, I think. Yeah, she's grumpy, you know, <laughs> fed up, not well, you know, disillusioned with life, but you know, very very sharp. <laughs> In general commentary on things, but you know, not all the male characters are um, are negative. Um, well, I suppose that depends, you know, how what you bring to it. But um, there are there is her son, you yes. know, um, Karol von Brodsky from her first marriage, who suffers from bone tuberculosis, and in fact, she brings in again here the experience of Lausanne, you know, from the diary and you know the history of um you know the medical there's the, medical the character nora yeah. who has uh, who's undergoing heliotherapy uh, yeah. for well, bone tuberculosis what, in in, yeah. the, in the resort well, town yeah well in one of the sort of retrospective um flashbacks we see you know um she talks about um carol's childhood and how he how he has to you know he spends his life there and what his earlier life there and then he moves to paris yeah um, and then he only comes back at the end of the story. And then there's this other character, a very, very unusual character in um, in Narkovska, the priest, yes. Father Cherlon, who also, you know, was part of the group that were with Zenon and Carol in, in, in Paris. Because, you know, I wonder what his function is. And, you know, he again, people gossip about him. And when he comes back from Paris and uh, he's driven everywhere around by the countess, one of the local countesses, she, she drives him everywhere in her car and everybody's gossiping or oh, they're having an affair. You know, we all know what he was like when, you know, he was young. They imagine um, him as the jolly Benedictine or well, something. Like well, that. they imagine him as, you know, uh, uh, sexually um, 
active. Mm -hmm. Yes. And of course, you know, when when we start learning about his background, what Zenon remembers about him and what Carol remembers about him from Paris, and then what he confesses himself later on to to Carol about what he did in France, he was having affairs left, right, and centre. You know, couldn't couldn't manage his um, his appetites. But you see, he finds what he describes as his own epiphany. By you know, it was very common that a lot of priests did this at, at this time. You know, in order to really understand humanity, he had to reduce himself. To the worst yeah so not only did he indulge all his his senses but he identified with the workers so he went and worked in factories he gave up money he really suffered and it's through he claims that it's through suffering that he understood that the purpose of life or the meaning of life is actually suffering and the most we can do with our superior consciousness of you know, above the rest of biology, is to show empathy and compassion to other people. And that ethical point of view, I would argue, is actually Narkovskas. That, you know, there's that parallel scene, um, well, not parallel scene, an, an earlier scene, which later parallels something that Chalon says. And that is when they're on, when she and Zenon are on their honeymoon uh, in the south of France. They go to the Monaco um, uh, Aquarium, and they yes. wander. They wander amongst these creatures, and you know, Elsberta thinks, "Well, how are we different? We're not different. All that makes us different is our superior consciousness." Fish are a, obviously a, a thing that if you moved her in, in, in some way because Chalon expresses what he means about suffering through the image of fish mm. he has this you know in, in their conversation with with uh, with carol um he talks about he remembered from childhood this scene of this live fish stripped of its scales um salted and then cooked and what suffering it must have gone through and it really completely puts him off eating fish you know um, this physical suffering, but there's an ethical dimension to it, you know, and I think that's all actually that can be said mm. about any any final comment from from the narrator. But you know, my point is that here is that Carol and both Carol and um, the priest Chalon are different from the other men. They're not interested in politics. Well, they are interested in politics, but they don't pursue a political career. They're not interested in power. On that note, uh, let me uh, <laughs> thank you for okay. uh, for indulging me and in, in discussing uh, discussing these works uh, here on the show. Uh, it's been it's been fascinating. Um, we've been in touch for many years, uh, but uh, we haven't really had much of an opportunity to have this kind of literary discussion. And, and this has been very good. Well, thanks very much. I've enjoyed it very much. So, what are, what are you, what else are you working on now? Is there more Narkovska? I know you're working on a big uh, Jacek Dukai novel. And, well, uh, yes. I took on ice. Um, I've been doing it already for three years. Um, I am quite well on with it now, um, but it's you know it's a fascinating project. Um, I chose to do it really because I wanted to be challenged. Ultimately, the ultimate intellectual challenge, which it definitely is a tr as a translator. And it's taken me to the limits of what I think is possible in translation. There's so many difficulties with it. Um, so, you know, I plan to maybe do a discussion somewhere, maybe with you or somebody Perhaps. else, uh, <laughs> when I have Good. translated it and finished it about the issues that it raises and the implications for translation. I mean, it's made me think quite fun, rethink quite fundamentally what about what I'm doing, you know, as a translator. But it's a fascinating book and it's absolutely totally different from now Koska. But I am also working slowly when I have the time on two other novels by Narkovska. One is Mircea Plivi, The Impatient, um, which was published in 1939. It's one that takes further all these sort of existential and, um, you know, pessimistic, um, you know, humanitarian issues and feelings. Um, 
But the other one is her final novel called Things with Zitya, which you could translate as knots or bonds or of life, um, which has a lot of connotations and interpretations anyway. Um, um, which is a political, well, Hannah Kirchner describes it as a political novel. Um, but to me, it's no more or less political than the, the romance or Count Emil or uh, Niedobra Miłosz or, or Granica, in fact. Um, but it is her final uh, summing up and judgment on the interwar state and on her generation. But it was published in 1948, the first edition. Um, and it's often ignored, generally ignored, because it's regarded as her communist novel, but it isn't really a communist novel at all. Um, it, she started to write it, in fact, in 1939, before Nietzsche was published. She worked on it during the occupation. Um, so most of it was written, you know, in the early 40s. But the big thing I was going to say about it, which draws on what I was saying earlier about the use of the diary as a repository for contemporary experience, which is preserved and then can be reused in fiction later, giving it an immediacy which memory doesn't have, is that she reproduces as the final chapters of this novel, the diary that she kept in 1939. Mm. So it describes the invasion because this, this final political novel, you know, it's a summation of, as I said, of her views about the state. Um, it actually concentrates on the last four years after the after the death of Pilsudski and the, the lead up to the invasions. But, you know, the, they're really powerful. These, you know, if anybody that's read the war diary will, will know that, you know, the last chapters of the novel, she transfers word for word a lot of the mm. time from the diary into the novel. So, you know, people have said to me, well, why don't you translate the diary? Well, I will translate the novel and those key parts of the diary will be in the novel so you know i feel it will be covered by that looking forward to it i mean uh, it's uh, really i mean if you like to have like you know these two you know to have uh, malvina and to have uh Shmichowska and italy and two plus novels of uh of um, Nalkovska, that really changes, you know, what we can do in the United States and in the English speaking mm -hmm. world in terms of uh, in terms of teaching, for instance, I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, most most Polish programs, you know, let's, let's be straight about it are pretty small. Um, so you have to figure out and you're dealing with universities who, uh, you know, who are looking at your your enrollments, and uh, you have to think, well, how can I include as many people as I can? So I mean, I know when I've been teaching that, uh, that I, I would teach uh, combined graduate and undergraduate classes where maybe the graduate students or the people who could read you know enough Polish might be reading in Polish uh, but I had to have works that were also available in English so yeah. that those students mm -hmm. would have something to do during that time uh, and uh, would often have something interesting to do uh, so we would be reading bilingually um, and at two different academic levels to uh, to maximize our um, our impact our exposure our, our enrollment so uh, uh, so these these translations have been invaluable. Um, well, I'm glad glad they're useful, <laughs> <laughs> and they're fascinating works of literature. So uh, for everybody, yeah, and they don't go out of date, do they? No, they, they don't, don't go out. Of, they don't go out of date. So thank you again. Uh, for your thank work, you. for your appearance here. We'll have you back, I'm sure. Yep. And let me thank uh, our uh, sponsors, uh, the Polish Cultural Institute New York, uh, directed by Robert Czarniewski, uh, Bartek Rymisko, who is the uh, head of humanities and literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, and was the person who first asked me to uh, to put together some kind of a program like this. Um, Natalia Iudin, my fellow producer, who handles all the video, video editing, um, the technical and aesthetic aspects of the program, and Claudia of Wana Draber, uh, the head of communi communications at the Polish Cultural Institute, who puts together the website, sends out the newsletters, and keeps everybody informed about what's happening at the Institute and what's happening here on our show. So thank you all for listening uh, and reading along with us. Don't forget to uh, hit the subscribe button below. Um, 
click the bell uh, to get notifications uh, about the about the future episodes of the show and what else is going on at the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. Um, let's meet again in a month when we'll be discussing one of Poland's most popular writers, um, Stanisław Lem, known for his science fiction and uh, for his philosophical novels, uh, whose centennial we will be celebrating this year uh, with Bożena Szalkros, uh, who was uh, on the show to discuss uh, Gombrowicz. She's coming back again uh, from the University of Chicago. So uh, thanks again, and I'll see you in a month.